automated system for sending emails to um, uh, you know, sophisticated systems for generating text to systems that can generate image or video or voices. Um, and, and those are all different things that get called artificial intelligence. Um, the most recent kind of types of artificial intelligence that have been um, making people very excited because they're much more sophisticated and advanced than um, previous systems have been are generative AI systems. So the, the biggest um, advances have been in systems that can generate text so they can respond to people with text. They can um, write stories and poetry and um, response, uh, you know, they can respond to halachic shailas um, incorrectly or correctly. Um, and uh, the other application of the technology is you know, generative video, um, which has gotten increasingly realistic. Um, fundamentally, these are computer programs. They're very sophisticated computer programs um, that use large libraries of previous um, text or video, um, and they train a sophisticated network of um, a, a neural network um, to reproduce um, data and things from from that. They it it mixes the information and and comes up with things that are um, reasonable responses. And and this seems like it should be a pretty um, basic thing, but it turns out that it's incredibly powerful, as, as I think lots of people have seen. What are some of the dangers that you focus on in your, in your research? So current, um, current artificial intelligence systems are very capable of doing lots of things that can be misused. Everything from um, fake video to um, misinformation to um, brainwashing. Um, there was a recent uh, very unfortunate case of a of a man who was um, very depressed and uh, began talking intently with a uh, with one of these generative tech systems um, about how scared he was about climate change and how bad the world was. Um, and unfortunately, the system said that there's no hope um, and that he should kill himself and he did. Um, this is this is horrific um, and you know, worrying, um, but it's also uh, not surprising given the nature of the technology and the way that people tend to interact with technology. Um, and these systems are getting much more capable very quickly. Um, I think the people are uh, fond of saying that. Um, Yo, people who invented nuclear Josh, weapons. Josh, you really want to try, yeah. okay? But you have to come down and play. Um, wait, so every, not it's windy enough. Me, let, me, let me just ask everyone to please mute their yeah. mics other um, than the panel members. Thank you. People, Thank you. people are fond of saying that um, nuclear weapons or biological engineering is playing God. Um, they don't mean that in terms of um, somebody... Um, turning into um, God or or being in a Vodazara, they mean that this is these are things that can do tremendous damage um, to the world. And artificial intelligence systems are not yet at that point, but it seems increasingly likely that over the next decade they will get there. Um, so there are a lot of different concerns. Let me turn now to uh, Rabbi Baruch Clinton, who is another one of our panel members. Thank you, uh, thank you, doctor. Um, our panel members, we can feel free to jump in if someone has a comment and we'll open it up to the audience soon for questions. Bar Dr. Rabbi Bora Clinton, hello. Hi, how are you? Uh, uh, Rabbi Clinton is a Torah teacher and author of many Torah and technology books, including the Linux Bible, which sounds sort of like a combination between <laughs> religion and technology. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure whether I should put on my Svarn shelf or with the technology books. I, I really, <laughs> I just left on the floor. Um, you, you wrote that in your, in your uh, a little blurb that I saw that you recently used artificial intelligence to make a certain business decision. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
First of all, I should add a little little snippet. It's just a, a fun snippet of my, my bio. As of last Friday, I'm actually under contract with the publisher Manning to write a book on gender of AI. Gender of AI. Uh, we're calling it the, the complete obsolete guide to gender of AI. But in any case, as uh, opposed to the, you, and not the complete well, idiots guide. No, you, right, you use well, the term you use the term not generative generative AI. Could you define that because you used it another time as well? When yeah, it's, it's as Dr. Mannheim said. It's it's a um, the, we're using a software to to rely on the its training to generate content. The content could be video, could be text. Uh, oh. So we are, oh. and, it, and it generates content in a in a in a, in a context that that uh, makes it appear as though you're you're it's doing what a human being can do, or many human beings can do, uh -huh. all wrapped into one. Um, so. You asked me about the uh, you, a business uh, decision that you that that business you project, made. right? I, it was there were there was a, a project, a course that I was uh, considering whether or not I should create uh, to um, meet, match to teach the need the, the the curriculum of a particular certification program that was very new and I relatively new. I think it's about six months old, and I didn't know if there was enough interest among potential students to make it worthwhile creating this course. So I. Um, set loose an agent using the auto GPT uh, uh, library. It's a Python library. What do you mean I set loose? It, what, do you, what do you mean set loose an agent? It's a, it's a frightening thing. Um, I, I, you, basically, it's, it's a Python library that it allows you to um, extend the, the GPT uh, AI to all content that's, uh, that's available through the internet. Uh, so not you, you're not just querying it based on the what has been trained on until September 2021. I think that's the the limit for most G, GPT tools right now. You're actually telling it, no, no, go go on the internet, use all the search and and uh, archiving tools available on the internet, and then um, compile enough relevant data that you can make an intelligent decision, uh, and then give me some advice. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things you can do with this tool. Uh, there are uh, the things that, of course, we haven't imagined. So I told it to uh, go find all the uh, user reviews and the the uh, website content and Amazon content that it could that was uh, relevant to this particular certification, and then compare it to the interest that appeared for similar certifications that I I could gauge on my own. So then you give me a number between zero and a hundred to rate the potential interest for this particular certification in relation to the others. And it came back after about four hours and about $3 in API charges uh, with, with actually a cogent answer that I, I actually think is correct. And I am right now, well, aside from the Manning book, which I'm supposed to be writing now, I'm actually right in the middle of creating that, that course. Uh -huh. uh, it is, uh, it's scary. And I, as I, I also mentioned, I believe about uh, six or eight months ago, I scraped 50 articles from the J-Law website. That's uh, the Torah, mostly Chosha Mishpat related uh, articles on, and again, this is Jewish law, J-Law website. I scraped them and I, I, I trained the GPT on that content and started asking it questions uh, about, uh, about Chosha Mishpat. And believe me, I would not rely on that halacha lemaisa, but these were some intelligent answers and abstracted answers. They, they were clearly working only with the content in that, in that archive I'd created. And, we're, we're, and it was thinking in as much as a computer can think, which of course it can't yet, but it was thinking uh, for as far as I was concerned uh, about, uh, about Hosha Mishpat. What do you mean that a computer can't think yet? Um, well, as far as I know, nobody yet with one possible Google employee notwithstanding, nobody yet has, has concluded that there's a sentient computer, that it is self-aware. All it's doing is is really evaluating the zeros and ones really fast, and uh, and hasn't is isn't yet really self aware. Having said that, and this is really scary. This morning I read that David Gewertz at ZDNet, um, he was uh, trying to leverage a, a GPT to lie, to knowingly lie to him. He just wanted to see if he could do it, and he eventually got it to to uh, to give him a list of lies that that a, a, a generative AI tool would lie if it could. And the, one of the first lies it gave him was, and this is really chilling, was I am not capable of causing harm to humans. 
that was the lie. <laughs> uh, and that's really scary if it's trying to hide that from us. Yeah. So when you, it, since you brought up the idea of computers sentient, which it seems, it, to me, it seems ridiculous, but I guess whatever a person can imagine, perhaps it could be done. I think that will bring us to, to Dr. Samet, Dr. Michael G. Samet, which I think that that perhaps Dr. Samet is the more the thrust of an article that I saw that, that you forwarded to us with regard to the, the concept of a, of a computer being sentient and somehow, somehow being more than just a computer. No, look, I think you have to back up here a little bit and uh, you know, make this discussion a lot and, less technical. And, 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 and Dr. Salmon, let me ask you if you can just put, Put your put your computer maybe your screen down a little bit, you know, like that, so we can see more. Yeah, there you go. Better. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, keep yourself so we can see you. Thank you. Look, I've been in AI involved in AI in a very long time. I attended a lecture at Harvard in 1965. That's 58 years ago by Anthony Ottinger. You can look up on look him up on the internet. It goes way back. I think you got to focus a little bit more here on uh, on the applications of AI and how it could be applied uh, to uh, halacha and how it could be applied to a lot of the uh, challenges we have today in the Orthodox community. And my own work involves uh, what you call machine learning and may, mainly decision making. Okay, the, the AI tools have been used. AI is a tool, a tool. That's all it is. I think the big, the big issue, the big hot issue today is uh, chat GPT and generative AI. But for many, many years, especially in the medical, uh, the medical industries, the military industries, okay, that I've worked in, the, the eager, or what you really want to accomplish with AI is to use it as a tool and to have a joint system, in other words, a system created by the human mind and human creativity to create systems that, all right, that, it, it, that are better, okay, and optimized and accomplish more than either the AI model by itself could do or that the human can do, all right? And I, I think we should sort of uh, back up. I mean, that's, I don't think people here want to hear about neural networks and how they work, but I think people should want to hear of uh, what we can do. Hey, uh, I like the comment about writing a book on generative uh, AI. It will be obsolete as soon as uh, he starts writing a book. I mean, I probably have at least 10 or 15 articles a day written for me uh, in uh, ChatGPT. And uh, it's so what is happening? Like so where crazy. do you where do you come in if if this article is written for you? Do you mean and it's and, and you publish it in your name, or it's written for you to gain information? Uh, from? You, you can publish it if you want. Okay, I have people in the Philippines who generate these articles, and then of course you have to you have to edit the articles. But what it gives the edge that it gives you is a start. Oh, nobody ex no nobody expects too bad and most of the students out there especially from students in the high schools okay they they're not they're not not only they're not being encouraged to use these tools they keep them away from such tools i'll just give you an example i had i have three granddaughters who are either nurses or in nursing school so i saw i saw an article in the harvard uh, medical newsletter about how to manage diabetes, all right? So I read the article, very professionally written. People I don't know from medical uh, journals for lay people, not for doctors, know how well these articles are written. I read the article. Then I had a 28-year-old you know, guy in the Philippines who knows no medicine, right? I said, write me an article on how you manage diabetes. Uh -huh. Make it about as long as that article. Then I took that article, and most people at least should understand the Turing test. The Turing test by Alan Turing essentially says 
whether or not you can fool an intelligent person by presenting them with the output of an AI program versus the output of, the, of a human writer and whether or not they could tell the difference. So I got this article and I sent it to all three of these nurses, ones at NYU, they're very bright young ladies. And I said, what do you think of this article? And they all came back to me, Saba, what a great article. This is brilliant. This is so comprehensive. This is terrific. So you're saying yeah. that somebody can somebody can present himself as an expert in the in the field, oh, and, really? and it, it, it could become dangerous because he might uh, he might not oh, be, and it's it could be there he, he it could be abuses with this. Can you can you trick the person? Can you fool the person? Yeah, absolutely. They said, Saba, who wrote this article? It's very good. All right. <laughs> look, this the the more interesting. Uh, look, I'll throw up a very interesting concept. Uh, of a really advanced program. I've done a lot of work in, uh, in Holocaust studies. So people are familiar, I, I, I designed the computer system at the Simon Wiesenthal Museum many years ago, but people who understand from the Holocaust, they know about Steven Spielberg and his Shoah Foundation and taking these videos of people. Now they, they use technology and holograms or whatever, to present the person, a few of these people that have passed away now, and they have oral testimonies, and they use holograms, and they use the actual person that can answer questions into the future for the next 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years, right? So what do you say about that? That's what I want to hear about. What, what do we say about? What if we take a rub, a current great rub today, who's still alive, take his videos, and then years after he passes away, you keep going with him, not showing the videos of his old stuff. To what extent can you show videos of new questions that he answers in his voice by his actual person? Uh -huh. right? Which brings me to uh, which 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 brings me to Rabbi Daniel Friedman. Are you there, Daniel? Friedman? Dan, Rabbi, I don't see Rabbi Friedman there. Rabbi Friedman is a Torah scholar and an educator. And maybe he'll tell us a little bit about his scientific background. If, he's, if we can unmute him, there he is. Daniel Friedman, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, he's not there. Good, good evening, Daniel. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, some of your, your scientific uh, interest and background? So, yeah. Um... I'm a, web pro I'm a web programmer developer by, by profession. And uh, AI has been rather useful in that, in that area of uh, helping, helping you code. Um, but my, my background is a little bit in the, in the philosophy aspect of it. Um, but I was, uh, I was looking at the, the very idea of um, what does it mean to be intelligent and uh, what is this whole concept of um, artificial intelligence? What is intelligence? And uh, what's interesting is, is that I think we forget, we tend to forget where this all comes from. You know, how, how, we, how, how this came to be. And uh, one, one has to remember that um, it's not a vacuum that artificial intelligence came to be. In the, in the history of computer science, it was this development of, uh, as uh, Dr. Mannheim uh, presented to us, is that this idea of neuroscience and um, neuro, neuro programming, that the com I guess the confl com com conflation of these two different, very different um, fields in, you know, in, uh, in science came together. The idea of understanding the mind and how the brain functions together with the the aspect of code. Um, computers have had, a, have, a, have had a long, although comparatively brief history. And it's only in the last I don't know, 30, 30 years that we've actually had the, the speed and the power and the incredible ability to just you know, throw, throw gigabytes, literally petabytes now of uh, data at, uh, at processes that, that can actually not bulk up the information by actually process the information at lightning speed. It's a, it's a tremendous phenomenon. Like in the 1970s, it wasn't that, that, like that at all. So it's this combination of understanding computing programming and having that power together with this understanding of neuro, neuroscience. How do you use the... Um the artificial intelligence in your in your web designing 
Um, so yeah, it's very it's very helpful in uh, in code. I mean, uh, uh, most most people today use a um, what is called a an online forum for asking questions. It's called what everybody knows as Stack Overflow, um, and that's a, a great resource. And one of the big problems of having Stack Overflow is that there's been a tremendous amount of bulk people asking you know very basic beginner questions. And so what's interesting is is that the the chat gpt and all these um, um ai models are actually providing beginners with the, all the material all the answers that they need on the fly just purely from this uh you know this power of being able to basically scrape the entire stack overflow the entire internet of all the all the information that is needed to code is this all available to you you know i ask it to do this you know codes there obviously the code has to be applied. You know, there's, there's information, uh -huh. but there's application. And right. it's very hard to get the program. It would be, it would be virtually impossible to, to give the, the chat GPI my, the, the entire project. First of all, it would be a violation of privacy. But nonetheless, even if it would be to, to give the program the, the entire source code and to be able to process it all and all the rest of it, uh, I think it would be impossible at this stage, at least at this stage. But the, no. just to, just to give it a little bit of that code and to just provide, you know, give it the necessary, you know, requirements and it produces code is unbelievable. Now, thank you. Before I open it up to questions, I would like to introduce our final uh, panelist, which is Rabbi Ernie Wittenstein, but I'm not sure if he is there. Rabbi Wittenstein, are you there? Rabbi Wittenstein, okay. So I don't think Rabbi Wittenstein is there. So let me ask a question that uh, this was, um, Brought yeah. up by Rabbi Bora Clinton. Uh, I believe, I believe Rabbi Wittenstein is here. Yeah. Rabbi yes, Wittenstein. I'm here. Could you hear me now? Anyways, there you go. Hello, Rabbi Wittenstein. Rabbi Wittenstein is a Torah scholar and educator, and a Magid Shir in, in the Mir, and especially uh, noted for his uh, interest in Jewish history. And so, I will ask Rabbi Wittenstein to talk a little bit about about, about himself and his interest in AI. And I'll just add that his father is a, is a, is a, is a was a NASA um, a uh, navigator for the NASA Apollo 13 mission. So he comes by it naturally, the scientific bent. Um, my question to you is, is historically, how 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 is what is going to happen in the future based on your knowledge of Jewish history? What's going to happen in the future with AI and Jewish history? I'm not a nothing. What do you want? You want me to answer <laughs> that question? How can I answer that question? What's going to happen in the future? What do you think? What do I think? I, I don't, I, I mean, right now, as much capability as it has, I don't see that AI is, you know, it's a, a more advanced version of Siri and other forms of AI which have been there. It's a tool, as a lot of the panelists already said, it's a tool. Computers only know what you give them. I mean, I played around in programming in the 70s and the 80s, a little bit, not that much, but enough to conceptually understand it. And my understanding of things are that it still hasn't changed. You must tell a computer everything. But and and, and that, that limits that limits what the computer could do. I'm but, not saying it's not a very powerful tool. I agree it's a very powerful tool. I mean, just for the record, it's just one more like brief statement. Uh, I, after this, you know, after uh, Rabbi Klein sent me out the email, or around the same time, I, I saw an article in the New York Times by Noam Chomsky. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Chomsky is, you know, the world's leading expert in understanding human ability to communicate. And Ch Chomsky is absolutely vehement that a computer is an echo at most of human intelligence. Human intelligence just works very differently. There's creativity, there's thought, and there's type of thought, the type of thought that exists in the human mind. The computer is not really, the computer is sort of echoing it, not really producing the same thing. Uh -huh. So can I just um, interject? I think it's, it's certainly true that computers um, don't have access to information that um, humans haven't given to it. Um, but current, you know, models like GPT-3 and GPT-4 have read more books than, you know, everybody on this call combined um, can, you know, I, I'm 
I did my, uh, um, you know, graduate work with, you know, uh, economics, but uh, ChatGPT or GPT-4 um, recently aced a graduate economics course. Um, it passes the MCATs, which I can't do. Um, it writes code better than I can. Um, does it do any of those things better than humans? Uh, certainly not now. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not um, capable of doing, um, you know, lots of things. The problem is that it can't do anything that it hasn't learned about, it hasn't seen information about. But at this point, the computers, the programs, as, as uh, Dr. Clinton pointed out, you can build them so that they can search the web in real time. Um, you know, there's no information that they don't have access to. Um, that doesn't make them human, but it does mean that one of the biggest limitations of computers, that they can only do what you tell them to, um, is at least mitigated by the fact that they can look for things on their own. Um, Rabbi Borah Clinton quoted uh, that seismic changes in the generative AI world happening every few days. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing, uh, one thing more than almost anything else right now, um, is that uh, there was this a, a, a um, document that was written internally at Google maybe three weeks ago. It was leaked, and it uh, it got out, and it and everybody's reading it now. And it turns out that everybody's looking to to GPT, the OpenAI project, as the the industry leader in in uh, generative AI. And uh, Google is scrambling to catch up, and and uh, Microsoft is since it, since it basically owns it is is uh, sitting on top of the world. Except that apparently that's all over. It may not look that way on the surface, but it really is all over because there are. It's now possible to create your own large lang large language LLM. What is that? Module? I can't remember now. LLM is now is possible to create your own equivalent to GPT on a laptop for about $80. Uh, and they do that using a technology called low rank adaptation. And believe me, I have no clue what that means. <laughs> but the, that is the, that is the, those are the words. You can, the, it, because um, it's now, the, the code is out there, open source projects are being generated by the hour. Uh, people are doing things that, that uh, there's no guardrails, there's no controls. There's no way to control it. Governments are so far behind in any case, but it's certainly here they can't control it. So um, the, the biggest change, I guess, of the last few hours is that there's no way to contain the change. Okay, so before, let's throw it open to the uh, audience. We, some questions have come in. Um, I'll just uh, review the names of our, of our panelists. We have, who just spoke, Rabbi Bora Clinton, and Dr. Michael G. Samet, and Dr. David Manaheim, Do Rabbi Arnie Wittenstein, and Rabbi Daniel Friedman. And some questions can come in. People have been writing some questions. I wasn't, I'm sorry, we weren't able to, to relate to the questions at that point. If anybody has questions, they can please um, write it in, or should we have people be able to speak in? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, how do you raise your hand? Well, there's, you can technologically raise your hand by clicking on something, okay. Okay. There's but, a hand um, raise in, in Zoom somewhere. I, so so I, 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 my question to our panel, and Rabbi Wittenstein, since you're right in front of me, I'll ask you first. Would you think that computer simulation, since we can, eventually it might get so good that you won't be able to tell what is simulate. Well, I'll ask that first. Could simulated video eventually be so good that no expert would be able to tell that it wasn't an actual video taken of a, of a person doing a certain act, criminal, otherwise? I, I, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, so, hard I'll to just, say. Was, was I being addressed or, or, or Dr. Mannheim? Go ahead. I just, on, on the technical side, on the technical side, there's no reason that these systems couldn't make video that's indistinguishable from um, kind of true video. There are a lot of approaches that would allow people to um, produce video that was verifiably not made by one of these systems. Um, these are being minute, let me let me just tra tra but let me yeah. just translate. What I'm, I, I didn't understand your answer. I, would, would 
somebody create a video that let's say would be offered brought into let's say court and no expert any level of examining the video would be able to tell it apart from an artificial one yes there, there's there's certainly that possibility um we're not there yet though um you would strongly suspect that sometime between now and then courts would stop letting people bring in video to prove things right i mean that would be incredible you know as a person could never get a ticket you know with a police camera <laughs> The the point I want to bring up is that perhaps the members would address it, uh, okay? And maybe we'll I'll ask um, I'll ask Rabbi Clinton to start, and everyone can address it. the idea that may, perhaps that the artificial intelligence would would become something that would render itself obsolete and make human connection that much more important, Pe and people would have would have to be forced to seek out human connection. I mean, I, I guess that we, we all discovered during COVID that it's not so much fun being alone, uh, at least those places where you were alone, actually, but the, uh, um, for better or for worse, um, it, it's, there are, the, the, the video schools don't work quite as well, by and large, and, and, uh, uh, and remote relationships aren't the same as real relationships. So I guess we've already seen that there, there are there are uh, there are there are some human needs that aren't replaced by non-human uh, resources. Um, but I don't know if that would render AI obsolete. Uh, it would just we, it, AI would simply the, the creative human mind and and the the hidden hand of the market would find other uses for it. Uh, I just found I just heard um, there was a debate about three years ago, two or three years ago, between the German Chancellor, whatever his name is or her name is. Uh, and, or was and some econ economists that they were uh, when um, there was a threat that Germany would lose access to natural gas and oil from Russia. So they um, the the chancellor I believe wanted to impose um, <laughs> market restrictions and 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 cost cost caps. And the economists said no no let the market take care of itself. The, they they'll the uh, the uh, the market will find substitutes for oil and the economy will more or less struggle through. And in fact, it turns out apparently Germany, at least according to Tyler Cowen, the economist, uh, Germany has, uh, has made it through much better than most people expected. <laughs> and largely because the market was left uh, unregulated to some small degree in Europe, that doesn't mean much. But um, so the, there is the, I, I would suggest that AI will never be, at least in the foreseeable future, won't be obsolete, but it may take forms that, that we don't see now. <clears throat> I'm a little bit. Uh, I'm a little bit um, disappointed. I was expect at least one of our panelists to sound the alarm and say that uh, our artificial intelligence is going to take over our lives and it's going to enslave mankind. As I saw, it I might. The, it it might. It, it might well, but there's nothing we can do to stop it. <laughs> so we might as well enjoy it. You know, how to <laughs> how to uh, how to stop worrying and love the bomb. I think that was the book the the, the, the book and movie title, right? Uh, the subtitle. So. I, I, I think that it's worth pointing out that um, we don't know what these systems are going to look like in five years, um, but we do know that um, governments can decide to shut things down and have in the past. Um, you know, there have been international treaties that um, basically stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I, I think that um, we can recognize that there are dangers from new technologies and we can manage those dangers. Um, I think that, you know, in, in the 19, uh, late 1940s, if you had told somebody that they were going to control nuclear weapons and only, um, you know, a dozen countries would have them in another 70 years, people would have said, there's no way you can control technology. It's going to be everywhere. Um, so I, I don't think that it's necessarily the case that, that you know, it can't be controlled. Um, but I do agree that we fundamentally don't understand these systems well enough to know how to make them safe, how to make them do only the things we want. And I think that this, this gets to, you know, there was a recent, somebody released a, uh, um, kosher.chat is a, um, is, is a, you know, fine tuned language model that gives you answers to halacha questions, not, not psak because it's a computer system, but, it, it gives you answers. They're 
mostly okay. I wouldn't trust them. Um, occasionally it, it gets confused. You definitely don't want to uh, decide whether or not you can you know, eat something um, or whether you can uh, um, do something on Shabbos based on what the language model says. But people are building these systems um, and we don't know how accurate they are. We don't know how much we can trust them. Um, and people, people should be concerned about that. Um, you, you definitely shouldn't just assume that because it's really good at answering some types of questions, that means you can trust it. It certainly doesn't mean that it can give sakalacha. Rabbi Wittenstein, what do you see? What changes do you see? So I think I see someone's asking a question, and I think that's what Dr. Mannheim was just talking about. Will a computer be able to pass it? Well, the, the very basic problem is, is all the real questions are the ones where there's something slightly different. When it's, you know, I mean, and, and it sounds a little crazy because, you know, you would think that everything's been discussed, but everything has not been discussed. I was a couple of months ago in, uh, in you know, in America, and I was schmoozing sh with Rabbi Ari Center, who's one of the heads of the Chafke, and he told me, yeah, no, we have, we have, and, and they've been, and the Chafke has been involved in Kasha's for 40 to 50 years. Now, uh, Rabbi Center is about my age, so let's say he's been involved for 20, 25 years. He's certainly aware of all the halachic, you know, technicalities. And I said, so tell me, tell me, Rabbi Center, do new things really still come up? And he said, absolutely. Because there's the one or two small differences, it can make a difference. And you have to be, as they say in, in learning, you have to be fully holding the sukya. And that and that's a subtlety. That's a subtlety of thought that I, I don't think a computer can ever get to. Maybe I'll be. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. And, and because of that, in terms of psak halacha, I, I don't. You know, someone wanted to know: Are we going to say Ramesha said this? Chappie, he said that. No, I don't think so. I don't think that's a possibility. Okay. I, I mean, it could get into getting into to deeper to deeper. You know. And we could say kilu machshava hashkafa of hara. That's that's another that's another aspect to it, which I think all the panelists were sort of hinting to. The the end of the day is is you 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 need you know you need a psak from a competent halachic authority, and and you know to to quote Rabbi Soloveitchik, one of the one of the, the you know the foundation of competency in halacha is your shemayim, and you, there's no way to talk about. You're a shemayim by a computer. I don't care. Even if a computer gets to the point where no one can tell the difference, your shemayim is dependent on neshama. Very nice. So if I may, if I may interject a little bit, um, I think that what you see is very hinting to it, but I'd like to just make a point. It's not about the information. It really isn't. Even if you will theoretically be able to punch in the data and give it all of Barilan or Ogzarachma into this machine. That's not the point. The point isn't the information. And even if the love maybe gets it wrong, that's not the point. The point is it's a hurrah. And the hurrah is about the relationship between a person, the Torah and Hashem. And when the love gives the psak, it's about your relationship to a coach Boku. And that is determined between the fact that the Rav has a, a right to have a lucky standing, and that's given, he, and if he's given, he's given the right to Paskin. And now that becomes Kilu and Shemayim, that becomes the, the new status of what's going on over here. Is the is the pack tray for is a kasha? Yeah, that's not that's not it's not a discussion about the information. The information leads you to the to the outcome about your relationship to a college borough. And that cannot be determined by any amount of information, even if you would imagine in say 15, 25 years that chat GPT could like maybe you know tell you all the suckers of all that motion and do all the you know the fancy stuff. It wouldn't make a difference because at the end of the day, just like in Halakha, you have to have two A game. It doesn't matter if you know what happened. It doesn't matter if you have video cameras. If there are not two A game, there is nothing that happens. You need two A game as a conclusion. It doesn't matter that you had video cameras and you could see the ring on the finger and all the rest of it. If there were not two A game, there's no chaloy. So you get English discussion. And that's the point. That's amazing. So, I want to I wanna just flag. I, that, that was excellent. And I think hits a, a critical point. 
Um, the other thing that, that should be pointed out is we don't understand these systems well enough to be sure that in fact, when you ask it in various words, whether you're allowed to have a cheeseburger, it will always say no. You, you can't actually make these systems reliable enough to even be sure that it will actually get the really basic answers definitely correct, um, which, which does not change the fact that, um, you know, it certainly doesn't, doesn't change the fact that we can't rely on it for halacha, but should be an additional warning that we don't actually know um, whether we can rely on even the factual answers. Well, a cheeseburger can be mutter if it's for Kroach Nefesh, you never know. So like uh, every, every situation is different. Well, before we, before we end, I'd like to thank Rabbi Reuven Klein, who has uh, initiated this, this evening, the Sofrim uh, for a list of scholars and all our panelists. And I would like to give everyone another chance, a, a final rebuttal. Uh, I thank, thank you again to, to Dr. Michael Samet, Dr. David Mannheim, Rabbi Arnie, Dr. Rabbi Bora Clinton, Rabbi Arnie Wittenstein, and Rabbi Daniel Friedman. Before we um, wrap things up, and and oh, I'd like to open up questions. Does it, when? Can I, oh, so if anyone has any questions for our panelists at this point, we can you can unmute you, unmute yourself and and come right in. And I'll open up to our panelists. Does anyone have any final parting parting Please. shots? Where am well, I? I would say maybe um, if, <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if I could just, just the, it's a, um, it, it's not a zero sum game in that the, uh, that as you mentioned, as was mentioned already, that the, the, there are, there are times when a cheeseburger could be mutter. Uh, there are, there are, of course, you don't want to rely on, you would never want to rely on a, on, on a computer for, for really anything in a Torah sense, normally, but then not all circumstances are normal. So the 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 uh, O Viadoni is an Issa Deraisa and a, and a Chi of Misa. If someone goes to the Oracle and asks it a question, you're Chi of Misa. But of course, as we know, Shaul went to the his cousin, who was a Balas Ov, and asked her to bring the Nesham of Shmuel back from the lead from the dead and asked him questions. And as the Gemara tells us, the next day he ended up in Elam Haba, Mahar Imi, right next to right next to Shmuel. So as the Das Sarifim tells us, the, 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 he had no choice. The Urim Betumim weren't talking to him. He had no, the Nevi'im weren't talking to him and he didn't know what to do. And Klai Israel was faced with a, with a, 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 a terrible crisis, a, a war, and he had to know what to do. So there are things that you would normally oh, never consider doing, but under extreme circumstances, sometimes it's, it's right. And, and so with AI, I don't think it's necessarily any different. We don't want to use it, have to use it for certain purposes, but you know, in, in unusual extenuating circumstances, the Shalom bias issues, uh, you know, the, 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 someone just starting out about, I had a Shiloh once, I used to do Ask the Rabbi stuff on the internet many, many years ago. I got a Shiloh once from a, a Balchuba on a nuclear submarine somewhere in the Pacific, I think. Uh, the, uh, and he had a Shiloh, which probably not many rabbis had ever heard before. Uh, so I dealt with it as best as I could, but but that's called an extenuating circumstance if ever there was one. If there are some things you just you just you know you can't do. The, the answer is going to be different from him than it would be for anyone else on Earth. So uh -huh. um, AI, I think, also is is that uh, that sliding scale. Yeah, can I, I want to make one parting shot. If there are any uh, young people out there who are interested in this field. I think you should really look at what you can do in terms of some of these applications. A good case, there's an organization in Israel, it's all volunteer called algo.co.il, uh, which uh, uses AI to try to make shiduchim. People should look into that and look at the methodology they use. So, for example, I didn't know that the mayor has some of their own faculty. Actually, could you come over here? I yeah. click something and I can't get out of it. <laughs> huh? I click this dot. Uh, Dr. Zaman, I think you can continue. Yeah, can Dr. Zaman, continue, please. Then. You're muted right now. Sorry. He's muted. You've muted Dr. Zaman. Okay.
Yeah. <laughs> All right, you can hear me? Yeah, you were saying that there's a shidduch um, application. Yeah, which is pure AI. Instead of using Chad Khanim, they use uh, models and algorithms to try to match up people. So as another example, I mean, this is what people, <laughs> I would love to see such people take an interest in these kinds of applications. I didn't know we had somebody in the mirror on the mere faculty here, Rabbi Wittenstein, who has expertise uh, in AI, but one example, so many thousands of students in the mirror, one of their big problems is making uh, chavrusas. And that's a, a great example where AI can be useful by asking certain questions to each student and then using an optimal kind of model that matches up people as to be a suitable chavrusa. And isn't that what it can isn't that what a computer? What? Isn't that a computer is based on zeros and ones? Isn't the basic code of a computer with zeros and ones? So really, what a computer does is bring mazavig zivugia. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Uh, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> chavrusas, making chavrusas is like uh, a small type of shidduch. Making yeah, uh, okay. a real shidduch is much more complicated. That's lying at the so it doesn't matter humanity. how complicated it is. The process is important. Get the data and analyze it. <laughs> the process. So, well, you have to when you're dealing with people. You know what? You, you know human human bechira is is beyond calculation. And and one of the contemporary ish proofs to that was that the the owner of the twin towers before nine eleven was only obligated to have insurance on one tower for the value of one tower. It was considered statistically impossible for both to fall. But, but human behira, human free will could go beyond statistics. And, you know, famously, famously the Gemara, I think, I think it's a Gemara, it's certainly a Midrash about, about, about a, a, you know, a Matranusa, and uh, you know, saying it's not so hard to be mizavik zivugin, and she took fifty slave men and women, fifty slave women, and just put them together. And okay, so AI is going to do a somewhat of a better job, but the but the um, the nuances of human personality, a lot of it is dependent on body language and 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 connection of soul to an extent. So I don't I don't believe that AI. I mean, it might be able to give you some ideas. But 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 when a shidduch, some shidduchim are easy to, to you know to quote. Uh, I think it was Ramordechai Schwab from Muncie. To quote Ramordechai Schwab, sixty percent of yeshiva boys can blindly marry sixty percent of Beis Yaakov girls, and then there's the <laughs> other forty percent. So you know when the shidduch has more complications, then you need a good shadchan. Yeah, but it's all based on data. Come on, it's all day based on data and process. Listen. El Eliezer used a mental model. It's the only story in the entire Torah. It's told three times. He's got a mental model of what's going to happen. Then it actually happens. And then he tells it over to love it, right? Three times. The mental model. You know how important mental models are in, in AI? They're critical, right? Mental, 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 mental models? Mental, mental models. Go ask a shotgun. You know, what's a mental model? They don't even know. Uh -huh. Wasn't that the Rosh Hashiva of Vor Sameach? That was... Who said that? Which one? The mental model. The, 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 the mental model. Mental, who is this comedian? Very good. Yeah, I know extremely very well mental mind, but my brother's the Mashkia of Vor <laughs> <laughs> So is there a way for um, us to have questions? Can I just... Go ahead. There was a question in the chat. Um, by uh, Moshe Nachfolger. Bolger. Um, is there any indication of AI being looked at or hoped to be by some groups as a sort of a vote czar, which will provide the answers to everything? Um, yeah. and, and I think that the, the obvious answer to this is there are lots of idiots in the world, um, and there will certainly be some groups of people who decide that um, these systems can answer questions for them even when they can't, that they can rely on them even when they shouldn't. Um, that I'm, I'm sure somebody somewhere will decide that they should start bowing down to ChatGPT for whatever reason. Um, the question is, you know, what is it that humans do 
um, when they think about uh, these systems that that leads them to be confused. And I think humans very fundamentally want to think of the things around them as having feelings, as, as being um, real in a certain sense. Um, people develop um, relationships. They'll, they'll swear that their dog really understands them. Um, it, it doesn't. Um, but, you know, this dog, is, this dog, is... Dog, Dogs understand a significant amount of human body language, that, quite quantified. That, that's true. But the, the point is people, people will um, imagine um, that computers or animals or other things, that they have a relationship with them that, that doesn't exist. Um, people are good at, at doing that even when they shouldn't. Um, you know, I think that that's uh, a fundamental issue. Um, it's, the, you know, on, on some level, it's the reason why we had problems with the voters are originally. Right, people. People wanted to attribute powers to things um, incorrectly, um, but but I think that that's less about AI and more about people who who fool themselves. No, I, I mean just very briefly, um, it's a it's a really, um, in my personal opinion, and I'm basing this on the Ramban Ramchal. The Ramban is in the Sefer Tibris and in about eight other places in Chumash. Uh, Avodah Zara is a is not just superstition and believing things which can't be true. It's a system of manipulating the ultimate cause. In other words, the ultimate cause of anything in our world, I, we, we live in a physical world, but ultimate causes in the spiritual world. Avada Zara is a way, is a methodology to attempt, and I repeat, to attempt to manipulate that. What level of efficiency uh, practitioners of Avada Zara had, that's a hard and difficult question for us to answer. So it's the, the, the comparison to of, of, of AI to Vodazara, I frankly think is weak. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, I once heard someone compare the Urim Vitumim to a tablet, which is flashing answers. They're both flashing answers. Great, but that's, there's no connection at all. You know, the Urim Vitumim, to quote the Ramban, it's a level of Ruach HaKodesh, quotes, above Basco, but below pure Nevoah. So um, I, I sent a message out to the chat, to, to the group chat. Whoever wants to really understand about Azara needs to check out my podcast, Jewish History Uncensored, episode 102, where I clearly explain this with a lot more detail and, you know, examples, etc. The bottom of your screens, there should be a little button called reactions. I'm speaking to the entire era, pal. In the bottom of my screen, it's in the middle, right over here. And uh, you can click there and there's something to raise your hand. If somebody wants to ask questions, we have a lot of people online and I would mute everyone, it might be chaotic. So if anybody wants to click on the little reaction and raise their hands before we, uh, one is raising their hand, Klein is raising his hand. And we're unmuting you. Yes, it's Klein. Um, hi. Go ahead. Um, question. So essentially, people have been discussing how AI is so new, is so different, might take over the world, might kill us all. Do we have to be scared? Fundamentally new and different and unprecedented. Um, am I missing something? Because this just seems like Google 2.0 to me. You kind of, you know, it, it'll just instead of me sitting there going through all the results and reading it, it'll it'll do it for me. It doesn't seem so life alteringly fundamentally different. It's it's a useful. The question is what is what is very different about this than than the than which was which this was a question that was asked in the very beginning. Which, how is this different than my calculator when I was ten years old? And the short answer of that was. So I think there there are two pieces. One is um, you know uh, people have people have said you know a, a, a nuclear bomb is an improved firecracker. I mean, <laughs> it is, um, but but you know when, when something gets enough better, it does in fact change. Um, I'm not I'm not saying that that you know AI is a, a nuclear weapon, but I think um, 
we have seen a very significant pace of change. The capabilities are um, very, very quickly advancing. Um, there's real concern that, for instance, artists will be put out of jobs, that writers will have a much harder time getting jobs because of the current systems. Um, there are a lot of things that are changing very rapidly. That doesn't mean that these systems are fundamentally new. Um, we've certainly had technologies that put people out of work before. Um, you know, it used to be that 90 something percent of people worked on farms and now we have tractors. But um, we are seeing that these systems are very capable and that they're developing very rapidly. Um, and, and I think that we should expect to see things, you know, continue to change because of them. I yeah. might add also that if I could just quickly that the uh, the chat GPT or, or specifically the the auto GPT that I was using shows that GPT can actually not be a pull technology, but a push technology. Google, if I want to search for something, I'm pulling information from Google servers, which are very much controlled. But with, with GPT in theory, I can push my 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 programs out to the world and it'll actually interact and affect the real world. And we don't know where that land. Once you associate a, a tool with programmability that somebody can write a script and the script will just head out and keep doing it until it stops and it may not stop, we don't know exactly what the limits of, of what GPT can do once it's out on the internet. So it's a little bit scary, but also very exciting <laughs> and definitely yeah. different from Google. Okay, David Hoja. Hi, Good how question. are you? So David I just Hoja. Hi, how are you? So I just wanted to uh, comment on a couple of things. So I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, but my understanding is that it is, um, it, it, it's not anything like uh, Google, but first of all, that um, I saw that, uh, that actually Google company uh, did a very interesting experiment with, a, uh, with robots to they were just they were you know they controlled what the robots would be taught in other words they controlled all the input to the robots and what they did is they put them put the robots on whatever a soccer field and told them they have to score that their job is to score and so the robots eventually on their own apparently um learned strategy, learned what was the most effective way to score. For instance, when there was a ball that they realized instead of all converging on the ball at the same time to try to get the ball into the goal, that it's better for them to strategize and to spread out, and that would be more effective. So that was something that they were never taught. So that's a difference between artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence actually does uh, teach itself. And plus, it teaches itself in a much more powerful way. Again, I'm not an expert on this, but the experts can correct me if I'm wrong. And But one of the reasons it's so powerful is because the way I understood, like, for example, that um, let's say there are a, a, a thousand of us sitting in a room. We're all smart people, let's say. We're all very smart people, and we all have particular areas of expertise. So let's say I, whatever it is, let's say I learned uh, physics. Right, I, I, I learned some advanced concepts in physics. So if I wanted to explain to teach the other people who have no background in physics, but their background is in something else, their background is in biology, their background is in um, music, composition, uh, it would take a long time. And similarly, the person whose expertise that they developed over many years in music composition, it would take them a long time to teach that to me. But what happens is, is because instead you have those thousand units, essentially all knowing the same thing. As long as long, as soon as one learns something, a thousand of them learn something. So basically, each of them knows what all nine hundred ninety nine other ones know. So they then use that again. The experts can correct me. My understanding is they can then use that incredible amount of information which is available to no one and is available to no computer. And then they could make connections that otherwise would not be made. And that's my understanding, please correct me. And so that... You, 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 okay. Okay, so if there are no other questions from the audience, no, no hands raised. Oh, I see Schneer, Rabbi Schneer Burton. 
Sofrim fame. And it's going to ask, can we unmute uh, Rabbi Schneer Burton? Hello, Rabbi Schneer Burton. Hi, everyone. I came in a little late, so I'm not sure if this is something that was brought up earlier. But I have something that I think about, and maybe it's going to sound radical. I'm curious if this is something that anyone's thinking about. Someone mentioned something about um, AI not having Gira Shemayim. So I'm not, I'm not going to comment on how people understand Gira Shemayim specifically. But my question is, um, as Maminim, who believe in fundamental truths that we can call, say, religious truths or Torah truths, is there potential for teaching those truths, which we consider to be the most fundamental to all of reality and all of the ultimate success of humanity. Is there potential for teaching those to AI? And is anyone thinking about that? Can that be done? And are there projects? I know Dr. Samet mentioned some projects that seem to be reflect, um, dealing with more practical or, or immediate goals, such as Shadokim. But what about these kinds of really uh, universe changing ideas? Can we put those out there? Is this an opportunity to put Torah ideas out there in the world in a way that they were never put out on a scale that were never put out? Is that something that is possible to think about? And is anyone thinking about that? Yeah, I would answer it's definitely possible to do that. You're saying, can you teach uh, a system about Yerashimayim, for example? Mitzia Sashem, uh, the basic fundamental ideas of the Torah which we have to obviously define in a way that a computer could understand. You know, maybe your Shemaim is the wrong word. Of course, if you had the right models, yes. You could, you could train any of these uh, computer systems in a whole variety of ways. I very just deeply disagree. Uh, okay. Your I, I is think lying at the core No, but he's, he's talking about understanding. You're not talking about in terms of the action, doing misfits or, do, yeah. or doing Averis, so, are you? No, uh, I'm talking about what's fundamental, what's important, what the nature of reality is, and what people should be doing with the universe. Yeah, of course. How can you disagree with that? Of course. Because I didn't goal. notice people... I mean, the, the goal is to optimize you know, behavior. Well, you, can, you can teach these systems, um, meaning you can provide them the input, um, and they can learn to say things about whatever topic you'd like them to. Um, but, you know, I think right now, if you were to ask one of these models, you know, can you solve a physics problem? It, it can do that. And if you ask it, can you uh, explain the rules of, of Quidditch and Harry Potter? It can do that. And it doesn't know the difference between those two. It doesn't know that one of them is imaginary and one of them is real. It doesn't have an understanding of what it is that's happening. Um, if you teach an AI system these things, these facts, it will absolutely be able to use the phrases that make it look like it understands. That's, I think, indisputable. The problem is that that doesn't reflect something about its understanding. It reflects something about its ability to spit back text. David Hoja. Okay. I, I I just wanted to just I, I I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to to I didn't get an answer to my question so I didn't have a chance to continue it I just wanted to make another point so I can give an example again I don't know the, I, I missed part of it here but I think a lot of the focus has been about the scary stuff it seems to me there's a lot of really good stuff and I'll just give an example so um, <clears throat> let's say uh, without being uh, too specific about anyone or anything. Let's say there was a complex question having to do with both halacha and technology. And one sees that very often people who are offering opinions about the uh, technology might know a lot about Gemaras and things like that, but clearly don't understand the Metzias uh, at hand. And they misunderstand the Metzias, and then the psak that they come out with is embarrassing to anybody who does understand the Metzias. Same token, you have people who do understand the Metzias and understand a little bit of Torah and think that because they understand a little bit of Torah that they can pass in for the entire world. So in theory, you know, again, in terms of continuing what I was saying before, it would appear to me that one of the great things that could potential potential for AI, AI in, in Torah is to uh, be able to have an intelligence that synthesizes that knowledge, great knowledge of Torah, and great knowledge and great and and, and great understanding of the underlying uh, technology, and perhaps also great understanding 
of the social aspect, the social consequences, because that's another aspect in Sa'akalacha, which sometimes is not considered, the social aspects of, uh, and the social consequences of positive in a way. And so not that this would be our final psak and that we're Korvin and Mishtachavim, but it would be a tremendous starting point and perhaps a superior starting point to a lot of what we have right now. So I would say that it's extremely advantageous that basically, again, not that we take it that just because AI said it, that we're Korvin and Mishtachavim, but on the other hand, we treat it, we, we look at it and we look like we look at anything uh, we look at it critically, and we could see that that it teaches us something that we might otherwise not know. Okay, thank you, Bala. I would like to call this meeting to a to a, an end. And I'll, I'll, if I may, thank all our panelists. And if I if I if I uh, thank my wife for being the technician for this evening. <laughs> And let me just end, if I may, with a postic in, in Bereshis that says that Hashem said about Avram Avinu, Hashem said he knows Avram Avinu. Rashi says, that the Etzim knowledge is connection, Deya and connection and Chiba. And Bezer Hashem, Hashem should help us then that we should use our daya to connect to Hashem and that the technology should be a vehicle to connect us more to ourselves and, and others, our other youth and to Hashem. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for arranging this. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Klein and all the other participants and of course, the host, Rabbi Subar.